She's been called a pillar of strength and dignity, the hardest working woman in the world, and the true queen of rock and roll. And Lord knows we can't stop talking about her legendary legs. She is, of course, Tina Turner. Born in 1939, this 57-year-old icon, yes, I said 57, has traveled many roads to get to where she is today. At the ripe age of 17, Anna Mae Bullock, Tina's real name, was determined to sing. So one day while watching the Kings of Rhythm, featuring the well-known musician Ike Turner, Tina grabbed the mic from the drummer as he played sing-along with the audience. Floored by the huge voice coming from such a petite frame, Ike was mesmerized and instantly taken by the young woman who he took under his wing and would soon take as his wife. Their two-part existence looked incredible to the world. Such hits as A Fool in Love, I Idolize You, and The Rousing Proud Mary skyrocketed the super couple to superstardom. Touring, touring, and more touring kept them on the road, winning fans both here in the United States and after an international tour with the Rolling Stones around the world. Their pairing seemed almost storybook until the facade began to crack and Ike's impatience took on a more public, dangerous, and abusive air. Tina suffered his wrath. As the picture-perfect world of the Ike and Tina Turner review started to unravel, so did Tina's own patience and her steadfast loyalty to a man to whom she felt committed, particularly after all he had done for her. But it was all that he was doing to her that finally gave her the strength to leave. So on that trusted day, Independence Day of 1976 in Dallas, Texas, after tumultuous marriage and grueling years on the road, Tina took flight. An ugly divorce gave birth to a beautiful sense of freedom, and Tina Turner, a name that she was given by Ike, but fought to keep, rested, regrouped, and returned. Nightclubs, game show appearances, and almost any gig she could get kept her afloat, but what she needed was a record. And with the first haunting riffs of Tina's renowned and sensuous rendering of Al Green's classic, Let's Stay Together, you knew that Tina had a hit, at least in Europe, where she had long been revered and continued to be treated like royalty. The single success was enough to convince Capitol Records that the tried and true talents of Tina warranted a full album. And what an album she did. On a shoestring budget of $150,000, Tina and her new and still manager, Roger Davies, put together a team that put together Private Dancer, her phenomenal comeback that featured the song that would become an anthem. And new fans. Hit albums followed, but the fickle American public that had praised Tina's return had cooled in their enthusiasm, while European audiences begged to see Tina every chance they could. So frustrated, Tina left the United States for Germany, where she still resides, and simply toured and released new music, not making the U.S. much of a priority. And the release of her latest and fullest project, Wildest Dreams, Tina Turner comes home to the soul of the history, to the rock and roll of her present, and settles into the newfound peace of mind of her future. The 13-track album features the smoldering Something Beautiful Remains, the hypnotic Golden Eye, and a duet that will be heard around the world, the title track, Wildest Dream, with the equally adored maestro of love, Barry White. Even in the midst of her world tour, which will keep her on the road through 1997, including a spring-summer stop back here in the States, Tina Turner was able to take time from her overwhelming schedule to speak with us, lyrically, about life, Ike, recording, her view on the legs that Haynes has finally recognized, and her sweet sense of peace. Lyrically Speaking is sponsored in part by Coca-Cola. Always the real thing, always Coca-Cola. By Haynes Resilience Hosiery. Haynes Resilience, it's all about strength and beauty. <laughs> I can say the first uh, first what I remember was blues. BB King was the only I can only remember radio and in terms of when I heard it was Memphis. I guess something. Uh, well, you know, it's about 57 years ago we took it. <laughs> it was blues, I'm sure. It was Laverne Baker, Tweedly D. It was uh, um, Faye Adams. Yeah, it was Brooke Benton. 
But even further back than that, I would just say it was mostly B.B. King was as far as I went with the blues people. At our picnics in the South, when we had big barrels of lemonade and fried chicken, barbecue ribs and the whole bit, and there was a Mr. Bootsy Whitelaw, that was the band. <clears throat> he played a trombone. And I forget the other musicians, but it was just him because it was, and he was very descriptive. And I was the singer. I was the dancer. I was up there, little anime. I, I don't know how old I was, but I was even singing then and dancing. And to what? I don't know what, what I was doing, but that's the memory of when it really became, when I became rather than listening. Well, it had been in me for a long time, but he wouldn't allow me on the stage because actually I was really quite thin. And in those days, women were really quite heavy, the Renaissance style of women, and good looking, I must say. And uh, I was just a high school girl that wanted, that felt his music, and I was sitting there with my sister, sneaking in, getting in, because who knows who, etc. And uh, I really wanted to sing. I just, just felt I can sing those songs. I know. It was, it was the blues, what Ike was playing. And so Aline asked her boyfriend, the drummer, to tell Ike that, I, you know, I'd like to sing. <laughs> I mean, you, you can't just just bring anyone on your stage to sing. He had no idea to look at me and the way I looked there like a high school kid. Uh, he felt, yeah, I'll call her. Well, that was one of those. So eventually, he got, got to know me as Eileen's sister, and I was sitting there bright-eyed wanting to get up there, just dying to get up there almost, but I, I never intruded. I knew that I shouldn't. And so one night, it was just one of those games where the drummer passed the microphone to my sister and uh, and of course Ali was very shy and couldn't sing and oh, well who was there right there yank give me that microphone and I started to sing and Ike was like I mean he was literally shocked for that sound to come out of this little girl that's been following him around asking him if I could sing with him and it was a, one of those really heavy blues it was one of those how do you call those swampy ones da da and this this young kid that had it in there, and I, yeah, 17 years old. And I got up there, I was perfectly at home. I, I knew all the songs, it was almost like fans that I have now that follow me around, you know, they know every step, they know every song. And uh, I was thrilled, I was absolutely thrilled. I was more of a star at that point than I am now, because right after that, I went out and he bought me furs, and I was riding in the pink Cadillac, and I had my, that was, that's, that's when you get it because that's the first stage is an expression. The first time you see someone is the, first, is the last time you see them because that first, first impression. And that was being a star of the long gloves and the sequin dresses and the furs. And, and I tell you, I felt stronger then about that moment than I feel now with all the people that I'm packing. I must say that I'm happy I'm not that person because I might be standing there with one eyebrow up and half singing because I was full of myself for a second because I was a star. That was the glitter dress and the high heel shoes and the stockings. And oh, I was in high school. This was, this was the movie star, as close as I felt, I guess, that I would get to it. It was wonderful. In the early days, when, I, when Ike and I were basically working the black clubs, the energy was, wasn't the same level because the black people liked to do the body stuff. And, and I never had time for that. I passed that one when we performed for my grandparents, you know? And, and I always thought that that's why we never really got the market is because of, they called me wild, with all that wild gal, you know? Because I, I need to spread my wings. I just like the energy of it, you know? And when, we got the Icats. They were those type girls too. They didn't, they didn't feel like doing it as one of those. And I said, come on, you gotta do this one. And then the next was a, this. That's all they wanted to do. And they used to roll their eyes at me. All right, don't give us too much of this stuff. We don't want to do it. But it had to be because it was missing with what we were doing. Sam Cooke, Shake, and, and uh, a lot of the other, you know, some of the James Brown music where James was mashing potatoes and really moving around, and I wasn't going to stand there. I needed to do that type. I mean, Jackie Wilson was, was doing the splits and spins and all kinds of stuff, and that was the energy that I was as well. So that's what it's about. It was about the, diff it was the, the same energy that Jackie Wilson, James Brown, how many of us really danced? Tina Turner, I think I was the only woman that did the dancing. But that w that's my energy. That's, that's how it all started. Yeah, it was probably about seven years into my relationship and my career with Ike that I felt that I'm not achieving anything myself. I'm not happy. 
this is not how I would do it. But I was loyal because I felt that he helped me to get started and it was a commitment of, because he couldn't sing and he had been really very nice to me when I was, uh, you know, the little girl from Nutbush, so to speak, the one that stepped on stage on his band. He's the one who had the big Cadillac and the big house. So I was loyal in that sense and uh, so I felt, well, I can't go out and do what I want to do because I have to make sure everything is all right here first. This is my way of thinking. Nobody, I'm not expecting anyone to understand. I don't care if anybody don't understand. I did it my way. I stayed there until I took care of home. And when home got to be a place that I realized that there was no end to taking care of it is when I, a mixture of other things. I didn't leave because of Korea, then I left because I was thoroughly unhappy. And, and I didn't work for a few years afterwards, after you know, stepping out, I didn't leave for, for my career, I left because of my life and I was unhappy. And it was, yeah, the first seven years, uh, how can I say, huh, go back that far, what was 1960? 1960 started uh, to get foul and it was at first in about uh, 67, uh, 66 was River Deep Mountain High and it was fairly bad then in terms of, because I went away and I went and did Tommy and I felt, oh God, this is what it feels like when you work from under pressure or doing what you can enjoy. And, and then Tommy came. And all of that was that exercise of really feeling what it could feel like on my own. I was attempted, I was tempted to it, but still very loyal. And uh, I still feel that I felt that I, I had something to do. I had to take care of where I started first because uh, it was owed in that sense. Not in the sense of money, but of, out of loyalty. Freedom Day, there it was. That's when I, when I took my leave, yeah. It was, it was fantastic, it was scary, it was, um, oh, my goodness, uh, I guess I'll, I'll never be able to stop talking about it. And I wish the movie had actually been able to have been shot precisely. Um, it had been a very difficult day because um, it had become a time when it was difficult for us to get music and airplay. Record companies changing hands as soon as we would give a record company a record. The whole team is gone and new people are in. People that don't really care about Ike and Tina's music and so etc. Et so it was, it was getting harder to please the record company as well. And, um, and of course I was to blame because I wasn't singing the songs properly. And, and Ike would always stay in the recording studio five days or something without sleeping. And so, I mean, everything changed after, you know, you don't get your rest. And so it was extremely irritable. And, just for no reason, he, he started um, being unkind on the plane. And it was the first time I said, no. I'm here, I'm trying to do something here, so to speak, which I've told the story in terms of my loyalty, and I say, but I'm not gonna go through this, this fighting part. Because actually, Ike, Ike's life with another woman is happening then, and it was known, it was a reality. And all of that I had accepted. And I just knew it was just a matter of time. But then I had gotten to the stage where, well, no more fighting me now. This, this other situation is happening. And he couldn't get that because he, some way I would say I think he felt that I still loved him or I was still connected to him because of my loyalty. But that particular day, it was just one of those days that I was wearing a white Yves Saint Laurent suit and I wasn't in the mood for fighting. <laughs> That's true. And... I was holding some chocolates and waiting for him to eat because we schlepping this food. I mean, it's ridiculous what, what went on there. We were schlepping this food around, waiting for Ike to want it. And it had better be there if he wanted it or he was a king. So I'm sitting there all done up holding these chocolates. And I went, oh, it had melted. And I wasn't aware of it. And I went, oh, yuck. Just for that, he attacked me. And I mean, that was like, for me, it was like, and it's not about the chocolates. It's just his rage against me and a lot of other stuff and so at that moment I felt well this is it but it didn't surface until actually the violence got a bit wor worse as we when we arrived it went on the plane it was uh, 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 all kinds of little annoyances on the plane and when we arrived we got in the car and it was, oh, I think it's one of these days where he leaped over the counter to get to one of the, the, uh, the agents and something. Yeah, it was a very, it was a terrible day. One of those days, stay away from Mike. He was really tired. And um, so we got in the car and um, it was that thing that gets things started. You know, you're, you're messing with me and you never grow tired, et cetera, et cetera. And I, well, there was nothing to say. So there's nothing 
to say because I hadn't done anything. I just held chocolates in my hand and it was melted. I had nowhere to wash my hands. And so, yeah, the fight started. I felt good, felt good fighting back because I hadn't done, I really hadn't done anything. Okay with the singing, maybe I'm not singing it because I'm not gonna tell him I don't like the song, but, but about this type of thing, it was no. And then also it was just about not accepting it anymore, not accepting someone to hit me anymore about such things when I had actually sat down and talked to him about that arrangement. Like, I'm here, hmm, that's happening, but no more fighting. And so I fought back with this, much as I, I felt good about it. I really, I felt, even though I was getting the worst of it, but I felt good that I actually got one every now and then, you know, I was, you know, I really, um, I have that sense of humor within all the pain. Sometimes something still comes through with it, you know. And I didn't really care that I was all swollen and crazy because I knew then that that was the last time. And, and so we walked into the hotel and he was, again, he needed to sleep, he was exhausted. And I was just like, I'm sure what the movie said, I was being the servant, can I get some food for you? No, no. And he's literally falling asleep. So he, he went in to lay down, because we were going on in a good hour, I don't know what I was gonna do with such a face, because it was beyond, it was monstrous-like. And um, I think he was trying to think of a way to cancel it some kind of way, but he just wasn't thinking clearly. And <clears throat> so. He was asleep, finally, and I was sitting there thinking. <gasps> my heart was in my ears, boom, boom, because I didn't know that when I walked out of the room, I could have run into some of his, his people. And, but then there was something there that I didn't really care. It was just about leaving at that moment, and uh, something was exciting about it as well. So I just grabbed my bag, and I put some little cap on my head because it was so swollen that it was beyond wearing a hairpiece, really. And I started to walk, it was like a movie when the walking became trotting and then running. Hotel I didn't know, the Hilton in Dallas, I, it was brand new. And, and I ended up in the back, all the trash cans and, and, and rubbish. And I sat there, just really like sometimes in the movies, because I, I had gotten out of the hotel. And I was really quite frightened because, you know, no one had seen me. Well, then I needed to know how to get across the freeway. <laughs> that looked really big. You ever stood on the freeway? Uh, this freeway is awful with big trucks passing. And I was still, but then I, I no longer became frightened of bike. I was afraid of the trucks and trying to get to the next road. And I did. I managed to get through the grass, over the freeway, and into the next hotel, and just literally walked in. And all my confidence came. I literally asked for the manager. And there was a southern man with a red face that I didn't feel I was going to do anything. But some kind of way, he, he got the message of what was happening and gave me a room. And then I started to think. But I was in pain for a while. I mean, it was, oh, it really was painful. And, and my suit was full of blood. <laughs> well, so I washed the suit. I prepared to leave. I rang a few of his friends and realized immediately that was the wrong move, that I had best try to find a way outside of Ike's people because I didn't really have any friends. And I rang an attorney that uh, represented Ike, but I knew he always knew something was going on. And he made arrangements with some people to come to the hotel to take me to the airport. And, um, and on the plane, I was all right. Didn't know what I was gonna do. That felt awkward. I was worried about my kids and all. And then got there. <laughs> Again, I started to run because Ike was really good at thinking once he's awake. And I thought he just might be at the airport when I arrived. So thinking ahead, I, I, and I just decided, okay, if that happens, I'm just gonna scream and yell because I'm not going back. That was the decision. And I didn't. I, really I went to Germany and stayed with some friends. And Eric Clapton had a song called Carnival at the time. Come with me, da 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 da, come with me. And I started to dance while I was there. And, it's, and I thought, oh, stage, work. I had missed it. I mean, all of that had gone to another place while I was getting my life together. And I, I wanted to get back on stage. That was the song that started it. I started to find out for myself what I'd like to do this. And, and I started to think in, in that sense of, well, how I would like to do it because it was my choice now. And so it, all of that started to feel good. I went and had professional clothes done for all of us. That felt great because we always dealt with seamstresses and all of that. And to have a, a producer that was really producing the show, really giving me a proper show. And Margaret of Las Vegas was always an inspiration because she had these dancers and they were really energetic dancers and the costumes was great. And I, and I, I wanted to do that. I'd like to have professional costumes and very polished, good show. So then there I was. There, I had that. All of that was feeling good. No stress. 
found a band that was great. It was, it felt really good. It felt very close to what I have now with my musicians, how I play with them. And it was, all, it was now it's on stage, it was all love. And then there were a few yinks here and there with a few of the musicians and all. But there it was, I had my own show. And what a show. I had people standing up. People had started to applaud. I had never had a standing ovation before in America in those conventions and those hotels. I got into those hotels that Ike was trying to get into and did a great job because of the sense I have about mind your manners now. You know where you are. You're in these hotels, so to speak, the Fairmont Hotel, Knob Hill, etc. You can't be as wild, so to speak, as you would be if you were playing for a younger crowd or in some of the black clubs, etc. And so we, I toned things down. I learned. I learned how to work audiences, depending on who it was, whether they were older and the different. If it was a wild, drunk crowd, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's the difference, you know? And um, only one of those that I will mention while I'm talking to you now is finally when I got to one of those where it was a, they call it pearls and black jersey dresses. This is the ladies, you know, and they, they don't even wipe their sweat, so to speak, you know? And I had them standing up. I gotta tell you, Knob Hill was rocking. Headlines next day said she pulled the cobwebs out of Knob Hill. She had them moving. I, I saw one woman. She was standing there. She didn't want to stand up, but everybody else was, and she felt that she had to. And I just watched what she did. And finally she just stood up out of just out of how do you how can you say out of the fact that it was what everybody else was doing and she wasn't gonna be the only one sitting. But it was okay, because I realized that I could do it now. That was that was when I broke the ribbon and said, I'm fine, I'm, I'm okay now. I can do it on my own. And then we went with that for a while. And then there was an offer to go to Europe. And Roger felt, you can't go to Europe without a record, darling, you just won't make it. It's just not possible, it's not how it's done. So he contacted Heaven 17 and a few other producers. And Heaven 17 had wanted to work with me. They, England, had a kind of a, what can I say, a kind of a respect for me as that, where they put me in terms of a singer. And it's like, oh, work with Tina Turner. It was, for them, fantastic. So, there we went. It was booked for, booked already, and no record. Uh, that's how Roger works. He pins you right up against the wall, and you, you're forced that you have to do it. And I said no, but now I'm, you know, you've already booked it, so to speak. So we got there, and Martin Ware, came with songs, <laughs> temptations, <laughs> every act in America that you can name. I mean, he was just, he loved this music and this is what he wanted. I didn't want to do the temptations. I wanted something else, you know, I was trying to change. So I ended up doing one of the temptations, and the most difficult one of the temptations did because they were all soloists. It was one where one had a lead here, one had another there. And so I did that one, but then we came up with the Al Green, Let's Stay Together. I've always loved Al Green. His songs have always just been a, great crossover and that one we all agreed upon so i went in studio never recorded electrically before no band just it looked like x-ray machines <laughs> it was really something weird slotting this thing into this machine and here comes the music the whole arrangement i'm singing to that well that was easy too because we didn't have to worry about him you know doing cuts over it was already done fantastic sound i loved that we didn't stray too far away from the original of Al Green. It was just my version and another version musically, but staying right with the same sound of what was original, not destroying that. And it became an, uh, I was in the Persian Gulf working, and I don't know who called and said, you've got a hit. I said, call Roger. <laughs> well, that's the confidence I put in Roger because I wasn't into that. I was doing my show. Do you understand what I mean? It was like, okay, fine. But well, whatever comes next, talk to Roger. He's doing that. That was the attitude about it. And then, of course, Roger Ray is very excited. He said, darling, got a hit record in, 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 uh, in England. England again, Rivers Deep Mountain High years ago. Let's stay together. But some kind of way, Cocker, what's his name? New York City. Oh, my goodness. I never would have thought. Oh, can't think of his name at the moment. I really like to because he was the one that started to play it in New York City. Let's stay together, an import hit. Frank, Frankie Crocker, Frank, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and he was good looking too, by the way. <laughs> For him to, to have, and still is good. <laughs> good. And, he, and then the next thing Roger did ring and say Frankie Crocker, and his name was really big at the time, has gotten his hands on this record and is playing it in America. 
and it started to work. And so then it was time for the album to follow a single. Oh, God, it was like no, no end to this situation. I mean, in my time, you put out a record, you did a picture, and that was it. Well, with Roger, there was tons of stuff to do. Oh, God. And it was videos, and then it was press, and then it was pictures, and then... Okay, we recorded the, the album, though, really quite fast. Mark Knopfler had a song to give of uh, Dire Straits. Terry Britton had one, What's Love Got to Do With It, which Roger literally dragged me in the studio. I didn't want to sing that little song. I was singing Hot Legs and Rolling Stone, Honky Tonk Woman. What can I do with it? What's Love Got to Do With It? But Raj felt, no, this is commercially, this song is a commercial hit. I know it is, he felt. So I said, all right, because I'm used to singing songs that I don't like, so it's no problem for me. So then, what it was like with Private Dancer was going from one studio to get a key and to get the music going to another studio recording. The next day, getting up, doing the same thing until the album was finished in two weeks' time. What is attractive about me is my energy of... I'm a friendly, clean person. I'm, um, I've been on the light side for a very long time before I start practicing Buddhism. And in my practice in Buddhism, it helped me to really know who I am. I'm a harmonious person. I'm a friendly, harmonious person. I surround myself with that. You come backstage to my show, you don't feel a lot of hostility, not even from the crew people. It's only love because that's what I, that's how I am. That's what I, I insist upon because I need to feel that around me. Also, I think one emanates what they are, who you are. But people say you are what you eat. The person that you are, it comes from you somehow. Um, I care about how I look in the sense of, because I have an audience and I have young kids and I remember when I was very young and looking up to movie stars, I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine a child being disappointed from seeing a star that they look up to and somehow they don't get that thing that they want to receive? I care about myself because of my audience and because of my public, but most of all because of myself. I want to look back and see my reflection and like how I look and feel good about it. The bear is like a machine, his voice. Oh, babe, I just, it had to be him. Thank God that he got in there. And uh, that song was always very special. I wanted to do it, even though it's not my style, but I, I want to change something. I need to keep up somehow with this album. I need it to be me, but yet to, to, to give an extension to myself. So that's why I chose the first six songs that you hear on stage are different, because I'm... I'm showing that it is possible to do it. It's just a matter of whether it's going to be accepted or not, but it is, it's done well. That one was hard to do because I need to speak really very low. And actually, to tell you, I had to sit down, relax, almost like lay down, to really try to get it. And then finally, Trevor came and he says, it's like rapping. I know what it is. You've arrived at the place where they open the halls, feel the mop with love, feel with love, feel with love. And this heart is pumping for you. And then I thought, oh, so you see, there's a, there's a producer that tells me how it has to be. And so sometimes now, I play around with rapping with it, but it doesn't really quite work for me. Everybody look at me like I'm a little crazy to try to rap with it, but it can be done. And so, then Banderas put his vocal on it, and I thought, yeah, it adds a dimension to it. It's, it's pop with his. It's not pop with Barry. It's totally R&B. He took it right where it belongs. It's absolutely uh, a Barry White song. It's one that Barry can also go on stage. I caught his act in Paris a few years ago and thoroughly enjoyed it. And it's one that he can add to his own repertoire and make it his as well. It's just absolutely right. I'd like to sing now. I'd like to, to sing for the people. I'd like to... How can I explain that? How can I say the same as... Um, for a long time, people referred to me as a dancer. And then when I started to record and gave them music, I was finally accepted as a singer, you know, as a scream, and not as a screamer, I mean, good quality music. And so now I think also there is an audience that would just might like to sit an evening with Tina Turner just to hear me sing my music, all of it, all of those kind of songs. And are you okay with that? Mm, by the time I do it again, I will be. <laughs> this is a long tour. It won't end for a while. It won't be for quite some time. I won't go out again for quite some time. And when I do it, I've already planned to do a very theatrical stage, something that's appropriate for that time so that I can get by with doing that. I won't sit down the whole time. I'll, 
it's in my mind. I'll, I'll create it now because it's there, and I know it's the people are kind of ready for it. And three years time, I'll be 60 years old, and I, I don't think, I, I don't think, and I'm gonna want to be jumping around. I might, but if I do, I will. But otherwise, I, I, I'm prepared now to be able to plan a show where I can have a part one and a part two to sing. Never you want to be it's all right with me. Let me be the one you come around and I'll never be untrue. Let me say I'm bad Since we've been together I'm loving you forever It's all I need You make me feel I so I found a wonderful place uh, Within me that I am um, it feels, it's, uh, it's not something that I can actually, I would need as much time as you have had with this interview to explain it. I'm at peace with myself, I can, I can say that. I think I'm over most of my karma. And my life is ro rolling very harmoniously and, and days of happiness. Happiness is not something that's every day, you know, it's spurts of it, which makes it even more wonderful when it comes, you know. Uh, my life is good. I can't think of a thing at the moment that I really want to do. If I never did another thing at, at this time, I'm all right. Um, which I'm sure there are some other things that I will do because of this newfound feeling that I have within me. Uh, it's, I feel like I can take a deep breath and say, I'm fine now. Lyrically Speaking is sponsored in part by Coca-Cola. Always the real thing, always Coca-Cola. By Haynes Resilience Hosiery. Haynes Resilience, it's all about strength and beauty. By Genuine Chevrolet.